Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today we are talking about Casino Royale, the 2006 film directed by Martin Campbell, written by Neil Purvis, Robert Wade, and Paul Haggis. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Arand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayeros. Hello. So, Trisha, I believe it was you that wanted uh, to talk about a Bond film. Surprise, surprise. I know. <laughs> uh, what, why did you want to talk about this film and, and the video that we made, specifically focusing on the, the opening sequence here? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a huge action movie junkie, um, as listeners will probably know by now, and I know you guys do. Uh, but And obviously a huge Bond fan as well. There is just something about the way that this movie came together It's such an exceptional example of a Bond movie that sort of, in in a lot of ways that I'm sure we can talk about, reinvented who Bond is, what Bond is, um, influenced much more by action films in the early 2000s. Before this, you have Die Another Day was the last Brosnan movie, which was in 2002, um, which was really more, and it felt more, and I think this is why there was this like dissonance, it felt more like a late 90s Bond movie. And so trying to like update Bond um, into the 2000s. What is that going to look like? You know, borrowing from other action movie influences at the time. And so I just think that there's so much about the writing of Casino Royale. And of course, we can get into Ian Fleming's novel as well that just came together to be this amazing screenplay. And especially in that opening sequence, it redefines sort of who Bond is as a character without stepping on the toes of who Bond had been up until that point. It's just like this very sharp like vision of who and what Bond is and will be for like this manifestation of the character. So I just, throughout the film, but especially in those opening few minutes, uh, just sort of a triumph of screenwriting, I think. I was, I was going to say, I rewatched this film for the first time since it came out, maybe. Uh, or I mean, I, I think I watched it a few times when it came out, but it's been a while. I had so much fun watching this movie. Right? Because it, it, I, I think my more recent memories of Daniel Craig Bond are like the Skyfall Bond, which, you know, I'm not actually a big fan of. I'm not a big fan of the Sam Mendes approach to Bond. I can argue about that. But... I... Like, I want to have fun when I'm watching a Bond movie. Mm-hmm. And Casino Royale introduces these new depths to the character. Absolutely. While still having a lot of fun. And, you know, I remember I was watching it, you know, just recently. And when it cuts to the Bahamas and there's like this, this the fun David Arnold Bond music playing. Yeah. And then he's like in a cool car and he's driving really fast in the Bahamas. And I'm like, this is what I want. I'm so happy right now. Just like, let me have some fun in my Bond movies. And I think some of the more recent films have felt so dour. I don't know. I I think you have to have that balance because that was the whole thing is that the later, especially the later Brosnans were very like, they were too much fun, right? They were super quippy. They were goofy almost. Right. But but I think Casino Royale within, within itself has the balance. You know, that's, that's why I love, I love Casino Royale so much is that the stakes are really high in that film. Uh, The love story is, uh, you know, tragic. Uh, There's a lot of, there's a lot of hard hitting moments that are, not fun, but it balances it with the parts of Bond that like are why I'm watching a Bond film, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I just I, I rewatching it again recently. I think it might be maybe my favorite Bond film of all time. I said that. Yeah, I I, I just I enjoyed it so much. The writing is so great. The dialogue is so great. Yes, it we is. can talk about um, Eva Green as Vesper. Like yes. Ah. <laughs> it's funny because I remember when I first watched it, my friend and I watched it, and we. We're, we enjoyed it just fine, but afterwards, one of us said something like, oh, it's too bad that's probably the best Bond movie, which was like wow. this weird like like <laughs> neg to it, which was like, <laughs> we enjoyed it better than other Bond movies, but also like we still thought it was like pretty silly, like the free running sequence we were kind of giggling at and like there's some other stuff. But it's one of the only movies where every time I watch it, it gets better for yeah. me. Like I'm just yeah, like, I liked it I better. I didn't appreciate yes. all the dialogue. I also watched it on like a you know probably a 32 inch like CRT TV back in 2007. Um, but uh, that's but your fault for the record. Exactly. And no right, right. <laughs> that, that's my point. It's like it was in the theater. Right. The last time I watched it, I watched it on like our brand new 4K TV, and I was like, this movie is beautiful. Uh-huh. Like there's so yeah. much good cinematography yes. and like the dialogue and stuff you don't necessarily appreciate the first time you see it and then that so it's really it's a really cool example of a movie that I've just like enjoyed more with every viewing as opposed to some movies I love the first time I see them and then the third time I'm like I still like this movie but like I've kind of 
taken everything from it I can. Mm. I, re- I remember watching it and, you know, so, so for me, my history with Bond is GoldenEye was my first Bond film. And so Pierce Brosnan was my Bond and I very much enjoyed Like that was a you're, very- You're a Pierce Brosnan lo- Many loyalist. Many children of the 90s, Brosnan yeah. was their Bond. And like that film, I think was very formative. Like I think it was one of the first like action movies I and was old enough to record, go see. And for the record, Martin Campbell. Right. Yep. And, and yeah. it's still like, I think it's a really cool movie. It is. And it's inspired like one of the best video games of all time also, which helped. Hell yeah. Agree. Um, <laughs> Slappers only. <laughs> yes. um, and so it, I think what was interesting is that going into Casino Royale, that was my first Bond switch. Like that was mm. the first time I saw somebody else play James Bond, really. Like I'd seen clips of the other ones, but I'd never sat down and watched one of the other James Bond films. Which... Oh, really? Not so much with the classic film, Michael? Not not so much. I don't know. <laughs> I hear Dr. No's amazing. I should go back and watch those classic films. Uh, it's okay. But you really could, you really should go, go back and see Goldfinger if you're going to do that. I've yeah. seen many parts. I feel like they were always on in my house. So mm. I feel like I saw parts of a lot of them, but never like... Anyway, so <laughs> like TCM, <laughs> right? Exactly <laughs> the Bond marathons, um, and so I think that was what was difficult for me with Casino Royale is that it's such a different Bond than Pierce Brosnan, Definitely. obviously on purpose. Yes, like that was right. the whole yeah. thing. Uh, but I feel like also it, it's it is a much more adult Bond. Like absolutely, it, it was it was interesting because it's just all these things that I did not associate with Bond, this movie leaned super hard into. And like, they didn't even play the Bond song until the end. Nope. And I was like, all I want from Bond is him to like drive a tank through things and have the, <laughs> and have the Bond theme right. playing. Da, 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 da. Right. And yeah. I was like, who? But I, and, the, the score of this movie is very Bondy, though. Like, I do yeah, appreciate it. Sure. Has, it's, like, of course form. it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, and even, the, you know, there's an original theme for this movie mm-hmm. and it it's a very bond theme, you know, yes. it, and it, I actually really like it. No, it's yeah. fantastic. And, and, and they do play it in a bond kind of way over but like score, cool shots of him driving a the car. The score is yeah. being used very consciously to sort of like not play into your expectation. It's exactly the thing that Michael is talking about right, where right. it's like they're trying to set up a thing that has already been well established. And so right. it's borrowing from sort of like bond um, score or like I don't know musical language right but it's not actually it's not fully realized yet which it's sort of a deconstruction of a mm, bond right theme. and and I think seeing it not kind of being there for that made it just an extremely frustrating process because it was like it was you made me go see it? yeah it made it was like I, I paid to see a bond movie and you gave me none of the things I like about bond mm. <gasps> seeing it again none of the things <laughs> That's how I felt. I didn't. I honestly did not, because most of it was like yeah, poker games. Yeah, your position games. is indefensible. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm alone. I think well, a lot no, of people. When I was younger, I was like really bored during the poker game yeah. section. Yeah, like I feel like, and it, now I get it. Now I'm like, oh, this is brilliant. But, right. Yeah. There's so much. There's so much nuance, and like you're saying, Trish, it's this deconstruction and reconstruction of all these things. And so watching it now, I can appreciate the brilliance of it. Like it is brilliant, and so th- that's just kind of been my journey with it revisiting it and mm-hmm. and kind of appreciating what it was trying to do and how well it succeeded at doing all those things. I'll hold some of my response to that until we get to our lessons we're taking away. But the like early 2000s was this interesting time of like the death of these franchises where you had Batman and Robin and you had like Tomorrow, Tomorrow Never Dies. The the last one was actually Dino the Day. Dino the Day. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. But, but you had these like movies where people were just like, okay, like Batman's done. Bond is done. We don't care anymore. And then you sort of cool off for a couple of years and then you come back with Batman Begins and Casino Royale. And, you know, in that interim, you have like Born Identity and Born Supremacy. Which we have to talk about because exactly, they are right. so influential mm-hmm. right, on where right. Bond went. I actually wrote a column comparing Casino Royale to Batman Begins, where it was like mm-hmm. you would never think of those movies together until you're like, oh, the, the gritty reboot. Uh, like yeah, the thing. Yeah. And I think Batman Begins is similar to what you're talking the post-9/11 about. post 9-11 gritty reboot. Of course. Right. Which yeah. has to be named. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But what, what changed in the 2000s? <laughs> <laughs> suddenly, all of this stuff has gravitas. Suddenly, right. real people are dying. It's not funny anymore. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, and I think that that's, to, to Michael's point, it's like both Batman Begins and Casino Royale are not the, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to show you gadgets. We're going to show you like all this stuff. It's like, no, no, we're going to sort of like take a more measured approach to this character and we're going to do it in sort of a quiet way that's still exciting and still an awesome movie and arguably some of the best movies of those franchises. Um, but it's also like, yeah, if you are 
20 and you're going to these movies being like, oh, cool, another, you know, James Bond, another Batman. Like, that's not going to quite give you what you're looking like, for. like, I so. wanted an invisible car and cool action sequences. <laughs> right, he was right. tied up naked and someone was swinging it like, <laughs> right. sure. Can we just, not okay, can we just for. talk for a moment about that scene? Like, Before okay. you say anything about it, <laughs> we're talking about the torture scene. The torture scene. Yeah. It is straight out of the book. Which I, which I didn't realize here's until you the thing sent that, that picture. Yes. Yeah. Here's the thing I have to say about a lot of Casino Royale. And I know none of you have read the book, so let me just save you some time. They were really trying to adapt this original novel, which was Ian Fleming's first novel that he wrote in 1953. That's cool. It was the world's introduction to the character of James Bond. It is incredibly grounded. Like, Bond himself is this kind of... He's still like... He's got some experience, but he's a younger spy and he's still kind of vulnerable in a way. And so like Casino Royale, you know, even the other like early Bond films that you look at from the 60s and 70s, they are adaptations of Ian Fleming's original novels, but almost like very loosely. Right. This is actually they committed to doing a pretty close adaptation of the original novel of Casino Royale. And there were several reasons why it took them this long to get around to that. And the biggest one is they didn't have the rights to it, right? So mm, Eon, E-O-N, which is the Broccoli's um, production company that owns the rights to James Bond, the character, and almost all of the novels. They basically bought everything that they could buy, but they couldn't buy Casino Royale. So when they started making James Bond movies, Fleming had already sold the rights to Casino Royale the year after he wrote it. So in 1954, he sold the rights to Casino Royale to somebody else, and then they couldn't make it. So when um, Saltzman and Broccoli bought the rights, they bought every other novel, and they didn't buy Casino Royale. Interesting. And so they couldn't make it, even though it was the first Bond novel, Mm -hmm. and it, like, arguably one of the best. I've read them all. It's, like... To me, still basically my favorite, but they couldn't adapt it and they couldn't adapt it. And that's how someone else was able to make the Peter Sellers, Woody exactly Allen, right. <laughs> David yes. version. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The couple of trash versions that they made. <laughs> um, yeah, particularly the 67 like satire that they made with Peter Sellers. Um, so anyway, that's why. And then they weren't able to reacquire the white rights until 1999. And so that's why it took them this long to make Casino Royale. And when they did, again, it was in this like post- born identity world right. where they wanted to do these really grounded, gritty, human, virtually no special effects versions of these big action franchises. And so they were like, let's be really faithful. So the the book starts basically at the poker game. Oh, interesting. So all of the stuff before the poker game is original, but everything from the poker game and onward is pretty much a straight very faithful adaptation of the novel, including all of the characters. Wow. That's yeah. cool. Very cool. Including that torture scene. So, okay. <laughs> it's straight out of the book. It's straight out of the book. So uh, my weird thing with this torture scene, when I when I first saw this it's movie- It's awful to watch. I, I think my brain just like was trying to figure out like what are the repercussions of this torture scene? Like, <laughs> like did he break Bond like in some way? Because like he's like in a wheelchair afterwards and like- He's like hitting his balls really hard with this like <laughs> thick rope thing. And like, is this like, is this like an important like character moment for Bond of like, is he like mangled down there? Like, what is this movie trying to tell me about Bond's genitals? <laughs> like, like, I feel like it's left up in the air and there's like this weird and there's and there's this weird like, uh, like line from Vesper of like, if there's nothing left of you but your right. pinky finger, like uh, you'd be more of a man than it, it's like. Wait, is he less of a man? Like, what happened to his balls? Like, I don't know. My, I feel like there was an an unresolution, and Look, it's like it's kind of important, like what's going on then there for Bond because it's like his whole it thing. It absolutely yeah. is. Yeah, so you're right. I, MI six has the technology. <laughs> <laughs> I just I felt like it was a thing that like the movie like put a lot of attention on was like we're going to like take this torture scene pretty far, and he's definitely like damaging Bond down in that region somehow sure and then it's just kind of like then we just move on well, I, I mean just, I was just this is just a lot of my, my younger it's... brain was very confused <laughs> and I want some answers I think it's an interesting and again it's straight out of Ian Fleming's novel so like if we wanted to get into like Ian Fleming's psychology deeply we could I'm not sure how useful that is in, in terms of conversation about the film but it is attacking sort of like Bond is essentially and always has been 
a conversation about masculinity. Yeah. Right. And so like you might as well directly engage that way. And, and other Bond films have tried to do it also. Like this is certainly, if you think about um, Goldfinger, right. Which is like the, he's got a laser like coming up between his legs. Mm-hmm. And he's right. like, do you expect me to talk? I expect you to die. Like but it's, it's always still, threatening that region. Right? It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still no, like Mr. sort Bond, of this. I expect you to die. <laughs> It's sort line. of like psychosexual torture, right. right? Obviously, because that is so central to the character of who Bond is. And I think that those things borrow actually out of this scene in Casino Royale. And so it's interesting to see this um, as like sort of the, an the, origin The, the point. origin right. of the exactly. psychosexual right. torture. Yes. And, I, and I really like Vesper sort of like one-upping him, you know, like in the yeah. sizing each other up scene. And then later in the, oh, you want me to wear this dress? Oh, I need you looking fabulous. And then like, there's like a sitcom moment where he like finds a tux. <laughs> like I already have a dinner jacket. That She's scene like, is like really cute. There, dinner really, jacket. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, I, li- I like that she is like, I'm not your Bond girl. And yeah. it's like, yeah, their relationship is just so well executed yes like yes like from top to bottom I mean, so the first their first conversation on the train is amazing might be my favorite piece of dialogue ever maybe mm. I, I think watching it again i like rewatched the scene like three times in a row mm. I, that was so good i'm so charmed and in love with these two and they're so smart and witty and like having a power game Ugh, like that scene on the train like made the movie for me. There's a, there's also something like very British about it where I love, you know, she said the the beautiful line at the end, how is your lamb skewered? One sympathizes. Yeah. And like mm-hmm. he could have said skewered just like me after this conversation. And, like he doesn't <laughs> said skewered one sympathizes. And I love it's so British, but it's also so like intelligently written. It's that clever British yeah. dialogue. And it's like, I think somebody I, I was, Rewatching the scene on YouTube, actually, just to like rewatch it really quick. And one of the comments was like, this is British foreplay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's just so much care put into the construction of this movie. And I feel like that's again yes. why why highlighting uh, this opening free running sequence, I think, was so brilliant. Because when you mentioned it, I remember that sequence as being like, LOL, like producers saw someone free running and they put it in the movie. And like, I didn't really appreciate all the things it was doing also i think because i was resisting setting up this new bond right but it is such an excellently crafted action sequence but i was also thinking that it's it's this kind of unique opportunity that the this film has because it is reintroducing a, a character and like that's something that sets it apart from other action sequences. Like yes. when I was watching Skyfall or Spectre, as I was going through, I was watching action sequences and kind of thinking like, why aren't these scenes the same? And I think one of the problems is just like, at this point we've seen Bond do a million things. And so there isn't that same kind of weight of, well, which way is he going to handle the situation? Because which whichever thing he chooses will tell us a lot about Bond. And so I think that's so heightened in that opening scene and what all it's it's well constructed and also the perfect way to do that and, and bring well, Bond it, into it's, the world. It's also yeah. like, it's a relentless scene. It's, oh, of it's course. watching it and kind of deconstructing it for this video has been really fun because I've I've appreciated it so much more than when I first watched this movie. It's just I just love how Daniel Craig is just like this relentless machine who will not stop. And it, it is different than the feel of the Pierce Brosnan. Well, mm-hmm. and part of the yeah. reason for that, there are a lot of things, but part of the reason for that is that it's a foot chase. Bond doesn't do foot chases. Mm-hmm. Right. Like mm-hmm. he basically, up until this point, he hadn't done a foot chase since Thunderball in 1965. Like Bond doesn't chase people on foot. That's not a thing that he does. He's like the old cop who's like, I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> yeah, right. But, He's in a boat or a car or something. Right. But I do want to yeah. point this out. So Daniel Craig was 38 when they made Casino Royale. That's like basically the youngest Bond has ever been in an opening film for a really? Bond actor. Interesting. Yeah. Bonds tend to be in their 40s. Like Bond movies tend tend to span like maybe like 40 to 55 kind of thing. That's how old Bond is in our filmography. Kind of the distinguished... Absolutely, yeah. exactly. Never say never again. Connery's like sixty, right? At yeah, that yeah. Point. yeah but that's not official. That's I not know, official Bond movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so, um, actually, Lazenby was, uh, I think, thirty six or thirty seven. So Lazenby was actually the youngest in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. But basically, this was our youngest Bond ever, and they were trying to set Craig up as being like young, 
impulsive, like very physical, right? He's willing to do things and, and able to do things physically that other Bonds are not able ripped to. Ripped as hell. It. He's ripped as, <laughs> he's gorgeous. <laughs> For the record. No disagreement. Uh, uh, and so like, but I love that they decided like, you know what? We don't, Bond does, Bond movies don't tend to do foot chases. Let's do it. Let's set up this bond with a really dirty foot chase. Yeah, it's dirty. Yeah, it is. It's, it's rough and dirty. Yeah, like it's it. a lot of texture to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really smart writing um, just in terms of like approaching a character. If you're going to try to set this guy apart and you want him to be younger and f- more physical and like, yeah, scrappy, I guess, and inventive and all these things that we like now can see Craig's bond as being or would define him as being, this is a great way to do it. One, I love that you kind of also highlight and introduce this idea that it's it's setting up his character arc because in this movie yes, Bond yes, has yes. a character arc, <laughs> right? Yes, right. Which I he think has is, a character arc. In so arc. many other films, he does not. Right, yeah. like yes. he doesn't change at all. But this is Bond becoming Bond and mm-hmm. losing this part of himself, but gaining what he needs to in order to be the 007 that we need. All these things, and I feel like that does so much work also and i feel like they kind of tried to recreate that in some of the later uh films but it but it's just so pure and simple here and all the pieces are just constructed and work in harmony to push him to that point i I think it's a really smart choice to have the opening scene be him getting his 007 status like Mm -hmm. what a clear way it's because he doesn't get superpowers like Spider-Man or something like that. You can't, you have to tell us that it's an origin story. Right. And the easiest way to do that is to say he's not 007. Yeah. And then, and then to have that opening, you know, the black and white scene, and then you have the flashback to his first kill. And then you have that beautiful line of dialogue where the, where the guy says, Oh, you did, you know, he realizes he killed someone. He said, how did he die? Your contact? Not well. Oh, he made you feel it. And then he says, uh, well, you needn't worry. The second one is, and then Bond just shoots him and says, yes, considerably. And I love that. Like, it's that that dialogue that kind of keeps you on your toes and it makes you, it's the two plus two equals four kind of thing. Like, you have to it do makes, some work. Right. Yeah. It makes you fill in the blanks in your head, but you do it very quickly. And I think you appreciate it so much more because you do that mental work yourself. And again, they're taking risks here. Like, no sequence in any Bond film had ever been filmed in black and white. Like, no sequence had ever had any sort of context for, like, the opening um, gun barrel, like, mm, sequence. Right. Like, it, it works really well because they're very firmly reestablishing, like, we're doing something new. So, like, we're going to give you the thing you want, but it's not going to be what you think it will be. Right? Unless you're Michael. You- don't get the thing you want. <laughs> well, and that's why it's disappointing. Well, and, and the way they even <laughs> terrible shot, movies, you're out of time. <laughs> the way they shot his his like first kill is super so high messy. grain yeah. film stock, like yeah. overexposed, yeah, and, shaky, I love it. and like, and it's a very ugly kill. It's you know, it it, it really is like this is not clean Brosnan Bond. This is like down and dirty. This is what like it actually looks like to uh, drown a man right, right. Yeah. <laughs> in a sink. <laughs> yeah. I also thought it was like this is kind of like screwed up that like. You know the official government policy to get your 007 rating is to like kill two people, right? Like that's the only requirement. Still like, sure. I feel like you shouldn't think of too hard about any of the yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, it's not the only requirement, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. it's like, but you need to have murdered at least two people, <laughs> right? Sure. Yeah, and you also get that the the, the fight on the <laughs> stairs with. Uh, with those two guys who are after uh, the henchmen chief, people. the henchmen. Oh, people, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that scene. Right, but it's an again. It's like th- this is what it takes for a human to die. We are showing you this, but we are it's not... also very born identity. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. But with yeah. the sword, <laughs> <laughs> machete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's also that the thing I completely forgot and still almost forgot until just now is there's that whole airplane chase or like at the, the end of oh, the first act the is like better than the finale oh of like God, most Mi- action movies. Miami yeah. International. It's a good so, sequence. That yeah. whole sequence is so amazing. Yeah. I, it's weird because it, even now it is kind of forgettable but like when I was watching and I was like oh this is so compelling. This is really interesting and yeah, like you were saying Brian it's yeah. it's so early in the film. It's right. not the finale. I it's... think you forget about it because it's before you meet Vesper. Right. It's before yeah. a lot yeah. of like the weightier parts of the movie come into play. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of gets forgotten but it's a really great sequence. It, yeah. And I mean just going back to 
I don't know, some of the things that we were talking about in terms of like how to write an action sequence, like you should present your character with choices that reveal character and ideally force the character into increasingly difficult choices, right? But also just basic expository things. We need to know what the goal is, right? We need to know what's at stake. Like some of these really basic screenwriting things and that Miami international scene, it's like it, it basically is a chase, but then pretty quickly we realize there's a bomb, Right. And so like once mm-hmm. you know that there's a bomb, then you know that Bond reaching this person and getting a hold of the bomb is critical to saving, you know, X, Y, and Z, this whole sequence. And so again, clear goals and the stakes established early on enough where it's like we can follow the action. Whereas I was watching um Quantum of Solace today, which mm-hmm. God bless. I like Quantum of Solace, and you were watching Spectre today, Alex. Yeah. So it's just and like I also I, st- I speaking of sequences that don't have clear goals or oh god, yeah, clarity at all. Spectre, I was <laughs> yeah, I was so bored. Quantum of Solace, <laughs> when I saw it again, I, I enjoyed it much more than yeah. I remembered. Oh, yeah. that, that the opening, opening, the though. opening card chase though, which is just like well, shaky, again, shaky what cam are the delight. goals? I have no idea. It's just shaky cam cars and cutting a lot. It's because you don't know what Bond is doing driving this car. Is he being chased? Is he chasing? Who I, are lit- the people I chasing literally him? can't it's see any of it, so I don't know. You can't tell. Yeah, yeah exactly. You also you like you have to watch Quantum of Solace ten minutes after you watch Casino Royale <laughs> right. because like it's a movie <laughs> yeah, that it's depends. Yeah, it's set ten minutes afterwards. Right, basically. but it also depends on you remembering lines from the first. Like M's big line to Bond at the end. You know, she says something like, uh, "You know, Vesper was right." I forget what the line is, but it's also like, "Wait, what?" About what? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the movie that came out three years Which, ago. Which again, I absolutely did not. Like, yeah. As someone that didn't even like like Casino Royale, seeing Quantum of Solace, I was just completely lost and confused. Because I know the Brosnan movies had the gall to try to tell a cohesive <laughs> story. Yeah. So like, to try to be connected to each other. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, can I say, like, I do love the Brosnan movies, except for Dying of the Day. But like, I no, they're good. Tomorrow, they're like, enjoyable. like tomorrow never dies, and the world is not enough. I must have watched. I don't know how many times on VHS. Some of like, those are not great. They're not good. Yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't say they're good movies now, but like when I was the age they came out, sure, like of they were, yeah, they were a like a big too. deal. Yeah. I was really into them. The first Bond movie I ever watched was The World Is Not Enough. I love The World Is Not Enough. It's I just, not I, a good movie. <laughs> it's not a good movie, but I love it. I just have such a warm feelings for it. No, but it yeah. was my first Bond movie ever, and it got me interested enough in the character that. Almost immediately after I saw that movie, I was 14 years old, which is probably when it came out, I assume. But like, I decided I was like, I need to see all of these. And that's when I went back and I watched Dr. No. And then I watched at that point from the beginning all the way through. The completest. Oh. <laughs> I started doing Look, that. I'm once. not here to play. <laughs> <laughs> I started doing that once. I made it three movies and it wasn't that I didn't want to continue. I was just like. This is such a time investment. I'm not going to continue this right now. Well, Dr. No and From Russia with Love by like modern movie standards are not paced the same way. But honestly, Goldfinger is. Like yeah. Goldfinger is super watchable. Yeah. Well, what I appreciated about, about the first two movies was I expected to go back to early Bond and be like, oh, it's full of gadgets and silly stuff. And like, it's Kinda really not. not. Like no. Dr. No is just like a spy drama. And then it's like you slowly introduce like these gadgets and this kind of like what you think about Bond. And that's exactly what the Daniel Craig. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. That's what Casino Royale does really well. There's no money penny. There's no cue. There's no gadgets. There's none of that. Like I remember when I did see when I did see it, because I was in more that Michael mindset when it first came out. I was like, where's Q? Like, where's like the scene where he gets they all the gadgets? They don't even introduce them in Quantum of Solace. Yeah. I was like, right. where's where's like the scene where you get introduced to like, Not here's Skyfall. your invisible thing. Here's your like, you know, special gun. Here's your. And even in Skyfall, they keep it pared down. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it is interesting tracking all the Craig Bonds as as it's become more Bondy. And like those elements are there and now there is a Q and a money penny and all these things. And I, I. I feel like it loses something like like the gritty reboot I think works because it is so grounded and it isn't trying to be the the fun goofy kitschy bond stuff and so as it reaches more toward that I I feel it not working harder well, than, I think, than normal. Well, I think what's weird is that it's reaching towards that while also like bringing on Sam Mendes to like give it the like American beauty treatment. You know, like right. it's 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 like don't try to do both of those. I don't know. And it I is, will say this incoherent. They would have, and by they I mean 
the Broccoli's and also the other producers of Casino Royale really wanted to more closely connect the story of Casino Royale to some of the like Bond lore stuff. So they like wanted to be like um, Mr. White, who turns out to be like the big bad guy in this movie, right? Um, or sort of the orchestrator of everything. They wanted him to be a part of Spectre, but they didn't own the rise to Spectre. So that he wasn't allowed to be. Uh, and so, like, I think that works to its advantage. Like, when mm-hmm. we start to bring back Blofeld and we start to bring back some of these, like, 60s specters. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, but when we start to bring back some of these, like, 60s villains who made sense in the 60s and they tried to continue making sense of them, right? Which, if you watch a lot of the Roger Moore Bonds, they, they get goofy because it's like, we've already killed Blofeld five times and here he is again there's so many blowfelds i mean donald pleasance is like the only and best blowfeld in my opinion but um no offense chris Waltz. but like you're trying to basically you're sort of um like the boxing at these shadows that no longer make any sense when in reality the thing that has made bond great over these decades and decades is his adaptability right like even with the pierce brosnan like goofiness of it it's like well he's fighting now his bad guy is jonathan price who's a journalist or like a media mogul right right (laughs) it's it's goofy but it's 90s right it's it's like an updated topical villain right he's creating the news right exactly (laughs) like as the cold war petered out they started looking for new bond villains and so and that's why quantum of solace for all of its failings still feels like it's about something because it's about like water water climate change natural resources and things like that and so when you try to bring it back to like a donald pleasant's 60s blofeld era kind of thing you're just like well we don't have master villains in the same way anymore right like dr evil right right. that's that's what felt so strange you know because we were watching the sequence where they like arrive at the like crater compound base and And it's like (laughs) it's like you got to commit Inspector, one one yeah. way or the yeah. other, like right. either make this like a really goofy, fun movie, or make it a real like serious, grounded movie. But you can't do both. Right. I'm kind of worried mm-hmm. about Rami Malek's like not great Russian or whatever. It's, it's gonna to be, be fine. Accent in the trailer for No Time to Die. I haven't seen the trailer all the way through, so I get to be ignorant to that. <laughs> He says, license to kill. It's like <laughs> that actor accents the accent thing where you're like, I'm going to choose one word to say correctly. The rest <laughs> of it leading up to it, I can just say in my name. But I think that's actually why Casino Royale is really effective. Le Chief is like a very accessible villain with a plan that is relatable, makes sense. Like they reference 9-11. They're like someone, you know, made a fortune right. on 9-11 betting the other way. That's what they're trying to do with this Skyfleet prototype. That's a relatable villain that seems realistic. And it's not end of the world. It's not like I want to blow everything up. It's like a very small, focused, dangerous thing that we understand, like you're saying. But but more more interesting for that reason. Absolutely. Like watching it now as an older person and then when I was, you know, whatever age we were when it came out. Like I I felt like it was the most interesting Bond villain because it's like, oh, yeah, people who are bankers (laughs) who are funding terrorism and betting against things and it, that that is that's a more interesting real world villain than yeah like crater based person mm-hmm. yeah thanks mm-hmm. to a friend of mine he pointed out the way that lashif says oops when he <laughs> re- when he reveals the second jack <laughs> And for the past decade, every time I hear or say the word oops, it's oh, always no. oops. <laughs> I also just love early on in the movie, he's like, don't be alarmed by my bleeding tears. It's just a side effect of Nothing my condition. Nothing sinister. I yeah, will say, sinister. a lot of the design of Le Chiffre as a character comes from the book, mm-hmm. but mm. the tear duct and the bleeding, like uh, crying blood is straight from the screenwriters. And what a great, like, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's very like, Bond villain, but it's right. so grounded. And it's like, it's just a little bit of a thing. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Like he just, he bleeds tears. It's like, we're still in a like Bond blood movie here. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Still a Bond movie, but a grounded Bond. He movie. also has like a titanium inhaler, which he uses. It's That's like, from the book. It's like a special, yeah, like yeah. silver inhaler. Mm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> While we're talking about other characters, uh, Jeffrey Wright is Felix Leiter. Character, I, I love. I him. love. I mean, Felix Leiter is like a huge character he from is. Bond. Has mm-hmm. always been. But I also, I just love Jeffrey Wright. Like I've loved him since uh, Shaft 2000 and, okay. and Basquiat. Um, there, there's this scene in Shaft 2000. If you haven't seen this movie, like. <laughs> 
it's is it a great movie? No, but it's like directed by John Singleton, so it's got some some weight to it. You got Sam Jackson, you've got Tony Collette, and then you have Christian Bale as like the rich white guy, <laughs> oh my God. and then Jeffrey Wright as this like thug like gang leader kind of thing. Oh, how cute. And there's this scene. <laughs> it is cute. <laughs> there's this scene where they're in prison together, and uh, and Jeffrey Wright's like his name is Peoples Hernandez. <laughs> sure. And he says they call me Peoples. You know why they call me Peoples? And then Christian Bale says. Uh, because you always takes care of your peoples. And then, and then Jeffrey Wright just looks at him for a second and goes, that's right, man. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since that moment, I was like, who is this actor? I want to watch him forever. Jeffrey Wright is a great casting choice for Felix mm-hmm. Leiter, who, again, is a well-entrenched Bond character. Um, but I like, again, it's a reboot of him here. He's meeting Bond for the first time. Right. He's not going like, hey, we worked together in X, Y, and Z. It's like... Again, you're starting everything over and you're like building these relationships from scratch, which is why they have like troubled to put Jeffrey Wright. Well, they put him in Quantum of Solace. He was not in the uh, latter two of the Craig Bonds, as far as I as far as I recall. But But he's back. He's going to be back in Bond 25. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's that rapport of like a character we're familiar with reinvented in a new way, which is what they ended up doing with Money Penny, which is what they ended up doing with Q. It's smart. Yeah. It's also interesting because Felix is not in any of the Pierce Brosnan. Bonds no, he's not. not and right. none of the Blofeld. Like, he's not like a fan favorite Bond character. He's just yeah. been around since the beginning. Yeah, yeah he's been just, around for a while. It's just interesting that there are so many Bond things that yeah were not done at all in the Brosnan Bonds. But I guess like you're saying, they didn't have the rights to them potentially. Well, Spectre, they didn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just the name is Spectre. But yeah. there were a lot and of Casino things. Royale, I guess. Obviously. Yeah, it's it's this mixed. It's an interesting thing about rights. But it's also just this idea of how do we define Bond right now, right? Who is Bond to us in not not just the generation that we are a part of, but in the time that we're in? And again, that goes what, back to what I was saying about adaptability, right? Bond has to, he can't be fighting villains from the past. He has to be fighting a villain that is now, that is a threat now that feels real. Um, and even if it's like a goofy manifestation of a real threat, right? Like Arik Goldfinger, like what does he want? He wants to rob Fort Knox. Okay. Like that made very cool. much sense in 1964. Sure. Boy, right? Like yeah, exactly. But then like Diamonds Are Forever. It's the goofiest of all Bond movies, perhaps. Okay. But it still is like, it's about something. It's like Vegas. It's about like the reinvention of Vegas with like all these mobsters and stuff like that. And then you go back like in the Moonraker. Yeah, it's Cold War. So it's like there's satellites and there's rocket ships and it's goofy, but it's still current events like I really like the gun from Moonraker in the <laughs> Goldeneye video game. It was always very satisfying to sure. use that um, that weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, so it's also it is also interesting how the the bonds though are borrowing from pop culture and you know like we talked about um, the Born Identity and like how that influenced the action films. But I feel I feel like one of my problems with Skyfall, but also what kind of makes it work, is that it definitely it almost feels like a Dark Knight reskinning yes. to me. Yes, I mean very much so. They, they catch the villain, but that was like part of the plan. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And like that, I just remember that being very distracting. But also like in that. But how ever Dev is making it work? Right. I mean, it's yeah, it's great casting, and and he's excellent. And it was just in that era also where that was the plot of every movie. Right. Where like, like Star Trek Into Darkness was like the same thing. Where they <laughs> like catch. Well, was that Ab- Ab- Avengers. Here he is. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's Loki's seriously. in a glass cage. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. There's a difference between. I mean, Mission Impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Get them all. Put them in a plexiglass box. Yeah. Yep. There's a difference between like the movies referencing today's society and movies referencing a movie that came out two years ago. <laughs> like that's right. when it starts to feel a little. Like, eh. Absolutely. Right. But Casino yeah. Royale, it's funny because you have like yeah, you have the Born Identity style, and then you have free running slash parkour which was a big deal at the time Mm -hmm. and then you have parkour and then you have uh texas hold'em which was like just started it and then you have the body worlds exhibit it was like that was that was funny that was funny to rewatch of like oh this was like a new thing right it's like here's all the popular stuff of 2006 yeah Yeah. um can i talk about britney spears's toxic for a minute please do sure go ahead (laughs) go with me here we're with you. So, this episode brought to you by Britney Spears <laughs> yeah. So this is all from a YouTube video that I watched. I'll, I'll put in the show notes. But so Toxic, as everyone knows, is an excellent song. Uh, and it features elements of Bangra music. It does. Uh, and surf guitar. 
And even if you watch the music video, there's this sort of like spy yeah. element to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right? She's yep. poisoning people with her kiss and uh-huh. stuff. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Bhangra music is, is a series of like samples basically taken from a Hindi film from 1981. Time out. Yep. Are you going to talk about how uh, the Bond theme comes from a song about sneezing? <laughs> uh, well, maybe. Do you know about Maybe this, I'm going to lead it up to that point right. and then you can take it from All right. there. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> So anyway, so they're using the sample and it's the surf guitar and it has this like spy danger aspect to the song, yep. right? Uh, and it's because, you know, we kind of associate the like surf guitar like sound to, with the James Bond theme. Of course we right? do from yeah. the 60s. Right? Yeah. Yep. Because that was a big thing, surf guitar at the time. But the James Bond theme, the person that uh, wrote it, borrowed it from another song that he wrote for an Indian movie. And so it's actually an Indian theme that they like adapted to be the James Bond theme. This is true. And so it's this whole like full circle of you start a toxic and then you get it. You get the Indian <laughs> and then James Bond. And, and then you it's come all, back to James it's Bond. All it's connected. all connected. But that right. song has lyrics. And it's like, <laughs> I am going to sneeze. I have a bad sneeze. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Just type the, in like... The Indian song is about sneezing? Yes. Sneezing. Just like go to YouTube and type in like... I think QI did a, a, a section on the British uh, panel show. Yeah. Um, to just type in like James Bond sneeze song or something. Yep. It's pretty amazing. Fascinating. Perfection. But wow. again, not really utilized in Casino Royale because they were trying to do something completely different. Mm, true. Both with the score and with all of the characters and everything, which is why I want to circle back really quick because we haven't talked about it yet. I love the casting of Judy Dench again as M. Uh, they didn't keep anybody else from any of the Brosnan era anything. It's a weird tying to the. It's a lab, weird tie. But it's Judy right? Dench, so it's I'm, so I forgot, brilliant. I forgot she was she in the Brosnan is, ones. Yeah. Oh, of she course. is the Brosnan. M. She was all the Brosnan ones. It's like if Michael Guff played um, uh, Alfred in Batman Begins. Like you would be like, oh, yeah. it's the uh, Alfred from Batman and Robin. And, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also Desmond Llewellyn played like Q in two of the Brosnan movies. So it's like. It, but John Cleese, come on. Yeah. I, I, I no, he wasn't. He was like R. He played something. R. All yeah. Right. He didn't play. Anyway. Played I, a character named I wish. R. I wish that they kept her. I wish they didn't kill her off in Skyfall because she's just so wonderful. She's amazing. Nothing against Ray Fiennes, but I just love Judi Dench so much as this character. Yeah. And she's just so superb in Casino Royale. I, every scene with her, I'm just... Her line, Christ, I miss the Cold War. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Dame Judi Dench. The I, I love I love her movie, just how annoyed she is with Bond the whole time. You know, when he's like, get Emma on the phone right now. And then, and then she finally, like, get out of bed and she gets on the phone and then he's like, I'll call you back. And she's like, <laughs> bloody cheek. <laughs> but it is, I think that that one thing, you can, you can fault all of the uh, Craig... Bond movies as much as you want to because there's certainly a lot of missteps across the four films that have been released so far. Mm. But the relationship between Bond and M is so well constructed. Yeah. It's a really, really amazing arc between that and Skyfall, and which which then like feeds into um, Spectre. Mm-hmm. And honestly, maybe I, it's probably not the only problem with Spectre, but like I miss her, right? Like, yes. r- again, mm-hmm. I, Ray Fiennes is a good M, but the but it's relationship, not it's mm. not Judy Dench, but it is the relationship where if you can accept just like in movie world that Bond is new, Daniel Craig's Bond is new, he's young, he's a brand new double O agent, whatever. And then he makes, basically, if you look at Casino Royale, he fails in every mission. He fails every single yeah. one of his damn missions. Like, he doesn't get Lashif alive, which he's supposed to do. He doesn't get the bomber alive, which he's supposed to do. He doesn't get anything that he's supposed to. Like, and he actually, like, loses in and, terms of, and like... And lots of people get killed along the way that shouldn't have been killed. Lots of people get killed along the way. And, yeah. Yeah, he, he doesn't... He gets out bet in the middle of his, like, poker game, and then Felix Leiter bails him out. But that's, like, you know... He fails and fails and fails, and then Vesper dies, so they don't get any information from her. Like, basically, the only thing that makes him come out, quote unquote, victorious at the end of this movie is that he confronts Mr. White. But even so, I love that, like, it's both really smart writing in terms of Bond. This is a new Bond. He's impulsive. He's fallible. Right. He makes a lot of mistakes. He's kind of bad at his job. And and M thinks he's untrustworthy. And so, like, it's that battle within M's character. Like, do I send him on this mission? I probably shouldn't. He, like, 
has messed everything up. It That tension exists between them for the first three of these Daniel Craig Bond movies, and it is really compelling. And again, it's conflict. Every single time Bond is talking to M, there's conflict. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the old 60s and 70s Bonds, it's like he Bond goes and sits in an office, and M goes like, don't mess this mission up, Bond. <laughs> and Bond's like, I won't. And he definitely doesn't. And then at the yeah. end, he comes back in and he throws his hat and it lands on the hat rack. And they're like, great job, Bond. And he's like, thanks, I tried. And that's what those old movies were. It's and like an Inspector Gadget episode. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it goes back to like Bond movies by the end of the Brosnan run in as enjoyable as they were to watch had been accused of being super formulaic. Right. And I think that's a valid criticism. Like, even though there are a lot of things I like about those bonds, they really did reinvent the wheel. And in a way that didn't feel like they were spitting on what had gone before, in a way that felt like they were honoring what had gone before and trying to make something new and grounded and compelling, relying on tried and true storytelling technique of like conflict and character arc and and all these things. I just so grateful. (laughs) Yeah. Because otherwise, what would we be talking about? Right now, well, like, I, what would Bond be now without this movie? I, I think you know. I think the thing for me is that Casino Royale, watching it again, it is the version of this new Bond that I enjoy the most. And I love Sam Mendes, and he's a great filmmaker. But I, I like Skyfall. I should probably watch it again. I have not seen it for a while, but I just remember feeling like. Wow, this is beautifully shot. Wow. It like, is the most gorgeous Bond movie, th- I think. There's there's so much about this that like looks very good and like looks like a very good movie, but like I'm not really enjoying it that much. I'm not really having fun in the way that even if even in a more serious Bond, I still want to like I don't know, be on a ride, be having fun, be have those moments of exhilaration. And I feel like the movie is almost shaming me into like, no, fun is bad now. You know, <laughs> now we're in the era that everything is very serious. Everything is very dark. Everything is always gloomy. And I just, I don't know, Casino Royale struck the right balance for me. And I've been waiting for Bond to get back to that. And I, and I think I'm just a little bit tired of the gloom and doom. Yeah. I, 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 there is something about the Bond franchise that is, that the reason I'm, a fan is because it's not all doom and gloom. It's because it's this extra layer of like, this is a blast. It's not all doom and gloom, but it's also not all cake. Like it can't all be just, you know, yeah, no, Pierce I, Brosnan yeah. I wanna, fixing his cup. I want to, like, ba- I want to balance. I want to balance yeah. is what I want. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think, I think it's just getting to have some pleasure and some enjoyment. And I think just, you know, watching parts of Spectre again, it's like, wow, this is really slow. Wow. I don't even know why anything's happening and it's like what's the motivation what are they even pursuing right now i think there's just kind of this luxuriating in you know this kind of the shot of desolation in the desert I, there's just a lot of that and not a lot of momentum and fun sure. and casino royale had the momentum and the grittiness mm-hmm. yeah the, the last thing i want to talk about really quick is that i so i've been kind of recoiling since you guys reminded me that m judy dench was the m and all the Pierce Brosnan bonds, <laughs> and I think it also you forgot. Well, so I think, I think she this plays is... a different bond. She plays a different M because she has to. It's See, but true. I think that that wasn't like. I think that's another reason why I didn't get or like Casino Royale because it was like, wait, is this a new bond or is it the same bond? Right, because this is <laughs> M, and I feel like that's my problem with like Skyfall. Also, like Skyfall gets like really confusing really quickly for me because like he's like he's in love with like the old 60s car that has the old ejector seat and all the stuff and they're like talking like in a way that's like oh, i kind of miss like the old days and i was like wait but but you're not the bond from 60 years like i feel like things get right very Did, like, meta didn't we confusing. just reboot you because right because also skyfall has these these themes of Oh, are, isn't this all tired and old now? Like, isn't it time like to retire Bond? It, I mean, I, that's what I remember from it. It was well, like, well, here's the interesting thing about the Craig we just Bonds, we just rebooted which is, it, which is Who's this guy Craig Bond. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about the Daniel Craig Bonds is that essentially the first two are Bond is this young impulsive upstart who like makes a ton of mistakes and is too young. Right. Like there's that. And then the last (laughs) two are like, he's too old. He should be retired. I was was so confused by that. Like middle grade, like, 
peak Bond where he's like wise enough, but also like, da-da. you know, there's it's like either he's too young or he needs to be retired, which honestly, that didn't start with Daniel Craig. Like that sort of has been the like parabola of every character who's played Bond where like you sort of shift immediately between like two of the middle movies from like uh, he's too young and he can't be trusted. And then he's like, he's too old and he needs to be retired. That that sort of happens to every actor who plays Bond because again, they are in their forties, pretty much all of them. And, and takes, so it's like, like that not, makes sense. You're not pumping out Bond movies every year. You absolutely are not. Although the Craig Bonds have been more spread out. Than almost any other right. like actor yeah. right. played. That's also one of the problems I think with my you know movie theater experiences with a lot of these new bonds is they are so spread out and yet their stories are trying to be so continuous mm-hmm. that I'll I'll walk into you know Spectre and I'll, I'll have forgotten most of everything from the previous movie. That's and, on you, Alex. Well, it's not on but the like filmmakers. But, but previous Bond movies didn't you didn't have to have like just watched the previous installment or, so, or yeah. like fill people in such that they right. can go into make the movie, movie self-contained like, somewhat right, right. Yeah. like i don't remember who mr white is eight years later ten years later when he was like an afterthought on the end of casino royale i don't know it feels out of step with the way bond had been previously and i think that's where some of the but you know what it the, feels perfectly in step with modern action movies as reinvented in the early aughts. But like, but, but, really, but these are really spread out. Precisely. And also the Mission Impossible series, to mm, be honest. But kind I, of. I don't know that you need to have seen all you the You can Mission watch Impossible Mission Impossible Fallout and not have seen anything. I mean, you I disagree about that very hard. I don't think you could watch Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible Fallout has the same villain from the previous one. That doesn't make any sense. But for like, for like a second, ma- yeah. yeah, I don't know. It doesn't like like that. I mean, that's an ongoing argument. I think is like a movie. I I believe as much as it can, which is impossible. A movie should be its own standalone thing, but also when it can, it is exciting to have these ongoing arcs over multiple movies. You know, I want to be able yeah. to go and see a Star Wars or an MCU movie or something, and be able to just appreciate this thing for what it is and not have to know every single character and everything like that. But I also want to feel rewarded when I have, when I do when I have just watched the last two movies in this trilogy or the last 21 movies in this series. You know, <laughs> I, I do like that sort of like pat on the back of like, do you remember this? We just gave right. you a little bit of that. But at the same time, I feel like when a movie depends on you having seen previous movies, then uh, it gets tricky. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like th- it's not wrong to do one way or the other. I think for me, that is not that was not baked into the Bond experience, and so I think that's why it's been weird. Because I feel like previously, it's a, it's a new thing. It's a new thing for Bond, to yeah, have which to isn't have necessarily seen. bad. But I feel like that has created a challenge for me personally. But as you said, Trisha, like that is what movies do these days. That's more what we yeah. are doing, right? Mm-hmm. Where right. we're we're expecting a little bit more of like an episodic experience, where we're bringing our like again, sort of very weighty expectations of long character arcs that have been created by film and mostly by television. Honestly, like, you know, if you look at sort of late 90s, like early aughts TV, that was really when television was starting to develop these really long character arcs. And we're expecting that. We're not expecting like procedurals. We don't want those anymore. And so Bond itself is shifting to be more adaptive to, okay, why don't we tie these movies together? Why don't we actually try to create like a long character arc for this manifestation of this character? And it might have honestly been maybe a little bit too early for that. Or like, again, what you're saying, maybe the gaps between are just sort of like what hindered it. Um, But yeah, it, it is this like, when you watch, no one expects... No one goes into a Mission Impossible movie, even if you haven't seen the other ones, to for there to like never be a line of like, well, you know about you know your wife, right? You, you know we know Ethan Hunt has a wife, and we know that like something happened to her, and that continues to echo forward into Mission Impossible films. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with Jason Bourne, whatever his past was. Like you don't have to have seen the first Bourne movie, but it's still we're expecting that to be to inform the character and to inform the character's decisions in whatever the movie is that we are watching. And I think that we actually want that from our Bond. Like when you, at least for me, 
if you haven't seen On Her Majesty's Secret Service, that's fine, right? That's sort of the most um, salient comp to Casino Royale, which is the only one that has a tragic ending where Bond falls in love with somebody for real. And spoilers, she dies right at the end of the movie. And that has informed, and, and like even through the Moore Bonds and the Tim Dalton Bonds and the Brosnan Bonds, there are these little moments where Tracy is the name of Bond's wife who who died at the end of On Her Majesty's Secret Service. There are these moments where she comes back where characters reference her and characters reference this loss. I think it's in License to Kill where somebody, he's at Felix Leiter's wedding and they go, oh, Bond, you should settle down. And he's like, I did once, right? Like, because he got married and she was murdered. And then it's like in the Brosnan Bonds where um, it's in Goldeneye where um, Sean Bean's character tells him like, you know, something like uh, all those women that died and you tried to protect them. And again, referencing sort of this like history with the character. That's when Bond feels three dimensional. Mm -hmm. It's when he feels 3D. And when we actually care about him, that feels poignant. And so trying to start that again with, again, a text the original text by Ian Fleming where he invented James Bond start and then try to launch a character from that point on with a ghost, which we talk about all the time on the channel, like give your character a ghost, give them something yeah. to like well, try to overcome. I, I love mm -hmm. Casino Royale as an origin story. I yeah. think it's, it's a great. fantastic yeah. origin yeah. story. And, and it's, it's probably more the fact that I just haven't enjoyed the, the films that came afterwards as much that I just haven't been invested in the continuing story. I never felt the need to watch quantum of solace more than once. Skyfall, I liked fine. Spectre, I don't even remember. I think it, there was just something about those movies that didn't encourage rewatching for me. And so with each succeeding film, I had forgotten most of the details because right. I, I didn't have any like internal desire to rewatch it the same way that I rewatched Casino Royale. Mm. So that's just, that's just how my experience played out. I think the balance that franchise films need to find is like... You know, let's say you watch a movie that you've, there's no franchise, it's a brand new movie. And in the first 10 minutes, a character says, you know, oh, you need to settle down. And that character says, oh, I tried once. Suddenly you go, ooh, there's like a history to this character. I'm excited, I'm intrigued, whatever. Now let's say this movie is a franchise film and you've seen the previous film and you go, oh, right, that sucked when that happened. Like I, oh, I'm so upset. I when mean, that's wife... Captain America, right? Where sure, but my he point, talks about that my all point time. is that exchange can work either way either way and i think that the problem i'm not saying bond has this problem i'm saying the problem in general with the sort of franchise film is the tendency to put in a line where if you haven't seen the other movie in the past few years it makes no sense it makes no sense yeah. and it doesn't have a weight to it and i think it's not easy but i think i really appreciate when movies find that balance where mm -hmm. it works either way Right, that right. sort that's, of that's artful the ideal. line of exposition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, cool. Why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from Casino Royale, Alex? I've kind of already touched on this, but I think, um, I, I think Casino Royale is a really great example of how you can do a modern action movie that has real stakes, that has real uh, weighty character arcs, and it even has kind of a tragic ending, but just also enjoy yourself along the way. You know, my, my complaint during this podcast has been about some of the the gloominess of some of the more recent Bond movies. And I think that's also pervaded a lot of, um, I don't know, modern franchise reboot kind of action movies where it's like, now we're in, you know, the 21st century. Things are gloomy. Things are serious. Things are like gritty and hard and bad and i and i like that i do like this grittier approach to franchise movies um but i think you know the the mission impossible movies i like the most uh the bond movies i enjoy the most are ones that also still give me that fun which is what like brought me to the franchise in the first place so i think casino royale is a great example of you can do both you can enjoy yourself and also give me a real movie experience with really great screenwriting cool Brian? Um, th this goes on what we were just talking about, which is this sort of like knowing a character, not knowing a character thing. 
where Michael, as the as my co fan of Solo, I think we can, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can agree the worst thing about Solo is the sort of prequel checklist. Yes. Right. Like the sort of oh here's how he got his blaster um, and here's how he got his solo. <laughs> right. <laughs> All that stuff. <laughs> and I think what's cool about Casino Royale is like, yeah, it's a reboot, but it's also a prequel. It's setting up, here's how this character that you've known to be sort of heartless and kind of chauvinistic and stuff, here's how he got to be that way. And I think that what I really appreciate about it is it's not, here's how Bond gets, you know, his job and how he gets M and how he gets gadgets and all this stuff. It's just it's a character prequel of like, here Truly. is this yeah, character yeah, yeah. arc that he yeah. goes on that leaves him somewhere where we can devote, like my favorite thing about Quantum of Solace is that it's an entire movie about this emotionally wrecked bond. Yes. Like, and that's I, like, I actually love the movie for that reason, even if I don't think it's a great movie. Um, and, and then also the franchise does take its time to say, we are going to introduce Money Penny and Q yep. and all this stuff. And then when you do get to Ray Finds M, then you get that long shot where he's going into like the red office and Money Penny's sitting there. And when you've seen the original Bonds, you, you're like, oh, that's that same shot. But but it took them three movies to get there. Right. Exactly. And, I, and I really appreciate the sort of like slow build to that that they did. As a, and if they make Casino Royale and said, well, nobody liked it. We're not going to make another one. It's still a great movie, even if you never got to all these things that you were waiting to get to. And I think that I really, I don't know what lesson that is for screenwriters. <laughs> like if you're making a prequel to a 19 movie series or whatever. <laughs> like, um, well, but, but it, it, it's, it's a good point of like, it, it's more powerful to do an emotional character journey Pre prequel setup yeah. versus right. all these like exterior objects you know it's like exactly. here's how he got this car and here's how he got this thing you right. know, that, nobody cares <laughs> right yeah. the dice for his <laughs> <laughs> yeah right, he, right. Does, he does get a gun at some point also right that's like one of his guns in casino royale not in casino royale is that okay no, 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 that's no, later no. on that, okay. later okay. because q doesn't show up until skyfall so right. like yeah. the the one that like imprints to his palm that's from skyfall okay yeah i think there's some Anyway, Ben Wishaw. But yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I have come to really appreciate this as, yeah, an exemplary example. Can you say that? Sure. An exemplary example. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, an um, excellent example. <laughs> sure. I feel like this is like a perfect origin story that I really yes. didn't appreciate the first time. Mm -hmm. And watching it again, even going into it ready to dismiss it and, and be flippant about it. I was just sucked in and completely impressed by uh, how they handled the franchise, but also just how they crafted the story and the structure. And it's it's just all there. It's all working uh, in concert. And it's just it's so impressive. So I feel like there's so many lessons to learn here. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's now probably my favorite Bond. Next to Goldeneye. We'll see. I don't know. Mm. Up there at Goldeneye. <laughs> Martin Trisha. Campbell has done your favorite Bond movie. Put it that way. Yeah. 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 Trisha. Um, my lessons go back to, uh, I don't know, I guess simplicity and scale, which I think are things that I've talked about a lot before on this podcast. But thinking about some of the most memorable scenes from this film are actually quite simple, right? Where it's like, he has to beat Lashif at cards. That's like, the whole centerpiece of the movie. And and that's sort of like the high point of action right at the midpoint of the movie. It's a card game, right? It's not this like big fist fight. It's not this like, and, and this goes back to a lot of the way that the production was approached. And again, a lot of the way that the adaptation was approached because it is a very faithful adaptation from the novel, um, which again, of course, is like, there are plenty of action sequences in Bond novels, but this is very grounded and again, realistic. And so just this like Bond got poisoned. What do you do when you're poisoned? Uh, well, you have to drink a bunch of salt water to make yourself throw up and then you're gonna like it's go great, to your it's car. A great it's sequence. an amazing sequence, <laughs> yeah. but the tension feels so high because you sense how alone he is. You sense how like the drama is happening inside of his body, right? That right. sense of like, a very clear, simple, very short ticking clock. And if he doesn't solve it, he's going to die, right? Same thing with like that car chase on, um, which this is straight out of the novel, but the car chase where he's going after Vesper. Yeah. And it's like, it could devolve into this like crazy car chase where they're like flying around turns and there's all these other obstacles in the way, but there's not. It's just, it's dark. 
It's a, a desolate road. And then the villains throw an object into the road that you can't run over. <laughs> and, and so like you're gonna flip your car over seven times to avoid hitting her like it's all of those like simplistic ideas of just like well what if you had to pursue this thing really quickly what if it's sudden what if the stakes went from here to a hundred in about 30 seconds how mm -hmm. do you react to that that's a really smart idea or like approach to writing an action sequence or like a, a thriller sequence idea like someone just changed the game completely it's not about poker anymore it's about you're gonna die in five minutes because you've been poisoned etc cetera, etc cetera. and same thing with that torture scene there's a reason why that scene is memorable and it's not just because it's like every dude's worst nightmare <laughs> it's, it's because it's simple and Lashif calls it out he's like this this is a very simple torture idea <laughs> and here it is yep yeah and again, and honestly, like the scene at the very end where the house sinks into the, the canal in Venice is an incredible action sequence, but there's a safety in it where when you're watching it, you're like, this is an action sequence. It's yeah, ba, I, ba, ba, I, ba, kinda, I kind of zoned out a little bit during that until yeah. the elevator falls in the water and it's back to the characters again. It's mm -hmm. back to the characters. Yeah. yeah. Just isolating your characters and giving them really difficult choices. Are you going to push the button and shock yourself back to life? Are you going to swerve so you don't hit Vesper? Those are difficult character choices, forcing your character into those moments. That's what makes an action sequence compelling. Not any of the sort of like innovative Splashy other things. Bouncy. <laughs> Splashy is my word. Bouncy there's no, is Alex there's no bounciness in this movie. I approve. It's not mm -hmm. bouncy at all. Yeah. I don't know. I miss the invisible car from Die Another Day and Bond <laughs> surfing. <laughs> Last thing surfing I wanted to, to say here, because I don't think we've mentioned it, I love how objectified Bond is in this movie. Yeah. Woo! Because I, because it's it's a nice it's a nice reversal it's a nice flipping of the usual. It's all about the the babes about the Bond girls. I mean, to be real, I mean they're also amazing objectified bond girls in this movie but we get to see i don't know about objectified i mean they're that's gorgeous true. that's true they don't feel like i mean the way, there, that, the way that they're there is like is not a, there is whatever. like a supermodel riding a horse you know in like a bikini in, in a bikini yeah sure but yeah. like juxtaposed Power, immediately, powerfully yeah in that scene juxtaposed immediately with daniel craig walking out of the water exactly yeah. right. in a very honey rider sort of doctor and no moment even vesper like her final line of like the train sequence mm -hmm. is about his perfectly formed arse you know so <laughs> yeah I, I think i think it's just a great uh example of taking a bond thing which is always about like the male gaze on the women mm -hmm. and just like once again, we're, we're, we're now in the 21st century. Let's have some fun with this. Well, and it's some self-awareness without feeling like that smarmy sort of meta, like where you can feel like a studio exec elbowing you, where you're just like, you love this, don't you? Don't you? Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like self-aware, but it isn't too heavy handed. It, it feels natural. Yeah. It, is, it, is, it feels like it comes out of the reality of the movie of like, this bond is very hot. So that will come into right. play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My lesson number two is if you can't appreciate like slow motion Daniel Craig coming out of the ocean, like I don't care who you are. If you don't appreciate that, like you're not, away. you're not here for the right reasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. just, want, just wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, hard agree. <laughs> uh, all right. Why don't we uh, talk about what we've been watching recently? Trisha, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I recently watched the 1971 Alan J. Pacula crime thriller called Clute. Who are you? Right. I mean, of <laughs> no course. one is sure. That <laughs> sounds like exactly the thing that Trisha is watching. Of course I am. You've said uh, that sentence a million times. In yeah. My head. K L U T E is how this movie is spelled. Um, Alan J. Pacula, if you don't know, is the director of All the President's Men and many other wonderful masterpieces. He's a great director. Um, and this movie st stars Donald Sutherland and Jane Fonda and Roy Scheider. And it's about a private detective who like starts interviewing a sex worker in New York City because he believes she's the last person who saw his like friend alive, essentially. And it, you know, of course, turns into this love story. It's, of course, this like violent crime thing. Um, but Jane Fonda won an Oscar for her portrayal of this character. Wow. And it's a fascinatingly made movie. It's really interestingly directed jane fonda's performance in it is complete i i got onto this kick because like she presented the, the best oscar. picture <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the best picture oscar in a gown that she re-wore by the way oh, nice. um not from her this movie but like 
Yeah. She's amazing. And I was like, I need to catch up on my Jane Fonda. And this is, she won an Oscar for this. And it's a really incredible and really fascinating crime thriller from the very early 70s. So 1971 was also the movie that they made Diamonds Are Forever. So if you want, like, that's like one of the, you know, sort of, it's a Connery bond, but it's very cheesy. This is like a very gritty version of it. And it's very good. Awesome. Diamonds Are Forever is like Blofeld hiding in cement. (laughs) <laughs> right is that that one no it's not uh i think it is i don't think so we'll, we'll get back to it's you. a good okay. kanye song okay circle back diamonds are forever is the one i think in vegas okay uh brian uh so my movie is one of my favorite movies from 2019 uh but it's my favorite movie title from 2019 it is portrait of a lady on fire yes Ooh, i want to see this yes! have you seen it no, but I'm like so excited. <laughs> I really want to no, see no, this No, no, I've movie. heard nothing but good things. Yeah. It's coming out, right? Like right now. Yeah, so yeah. it's actually in, um, it's coming out into wide theaters, at least in the States, uh, this month. So it, I was going to talk about it anyway, and I just happened to see an ad today. I was like, oh, good, well-timed. Um, it's written and directed by Celine Siyama, I believe is her name. Uh, it's a French film, and the premise kind of ignore this after I say it, which is like this woman, Marianne, uh, in the 1800s, 1770, 1770. Thank you. Wiki. Um, thank you. Wikipedia. Uh, she has to go to this Island off the coast of France to paint the portrait of this other woman, Eloise. And Eloise is like a little off, off a little bit. So, Marianne can't let her know that she's there to paint her portrait because her portrait's going to be sent to somebody she's supposed to marry. Like, it's a weird premise. It's, it, but the premise, you don't care. Like, t- 20 minutes in the movie, you're like, I don't care about what the premise is. But it's about these two characters and how they impact each other. And then the actual act of painting becomes a sort of metaphor throughout the movie and how they relate to each other. And it's just a, an absolutely beautiful film that when it was over, it was like, it's one of those movies that when it ends, you're just like as excited as you were in the middle of the movie. Like, cause it's just very powerful. Um, yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Very cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Cool. Alex. So Trisha and I were at Sundance mm-hmm. recently, uh, which was a lot of fun. Exhausting, but fun. Oh, it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Sundance is quite a trip. If you're trying to get a lot of movies in, it's it's a, it's a wild ride. Mm-hmm. But I saw a lot of great movies. And uh, one of them is now kind of starting to open across the United States and, you know, LA, New York. And it's just, you know spreading to more cities. Uh, it's a foreign film called And Then We Danced. And I've been telling everybody about this movie because I think it was my favorite one that I saw at Sundance. It's true. Uh, yes, Michael knows. <laughs> I've been talking about it. Uh, and I think why I resonated w- with it so much is that it's it's by a Swedish director, but it's a Swedish director uh, whose family is from Georgia, the country Georgia, not mm-hmm. the state. Um, and you know, I am married to an Armenian, uh, a gay Armenian man. And Georgia and Armenia are very similar countries. They're both you know, formerly part of the Soviet Union. They're in this kind of Middle Eastern region. So very traditional cultures. And uh, I've never seen uh, a, just a really great movie on its own terms. Like it's just a good movie through and through that also so accurately captures that culture and and both celebrates that culture while also deeply critiquing it. Because, you know, if you're gay in that traditional culture, it's a big problem. And uh, I would say this movie is like a uh, it's a mix between um, Call Me By Your Name, that kind of coming of age uh, queer love story uh, and a movie like Whiplash or Black Swan is very, you know, its own thing. But but it's you know, it's about dance. It's about competition and okay. it's about mm-hmm. pushing yourself. And so there's there's a lot of different things going on in this one film and it balances them all really well. And it's just a really lovely beautiful movie from start to finish the actors are great it's all so natural and so real so if it's coming to your city near you check it out uh it's really worth your time nice awesome michael just because you mentioned sundance and because we just talked about casino royale i have to say that every time i see ava green i think of when we saw <gasps> Perfect Sense, Perfect Sense. Sundance oh, back in 2011. That movie is upsetting. That movie is so intense. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I, I feel like it was that Sundance effect thing where in the theater I was like, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the best piece of cinema I have <laughs> ever seen <laughs> yes, in my yes, life. Yes. Uh, it, it is a gorgeous movie. I mean, it's, it's a strange movie, but it yeah. leaves you with this feeling of deep sadness. I really want to yeah. see it again, I think, maybe. Or maybe I just want to 
live with my memory of it. But well, anyway. it's a great example of a movie that uses the medium to make you feel what the characters are feeling. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I should. Yeah. I'll see it again. Also, but if you anyway. like Ava Green movies, everyone should see The Dreamers. I'm just going to put that That was there. her first movie. I do want to see like it. Breakout. It's yeah. fantastic. It's one of those movies that I've only seen once. And like every frame of it is like burned into my brain. It's wow. really interesting and very visceral. Nice. I like that we had a little mini Ava Green. Ava Green! We, <laughs> so I we love didn't her. talk about her enough. We I know. truly did. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's true. She's, she's amazing. So she's freaking phenomenal. great in this yeah. movie. It goes without saying almost. It's just anyway, so I so all the movies that I've seen recently have just been me catching up on all the Oscar nominations, and I feel like we've already talked about all of them on on the podcast. Um but I, I was very happy with the screenwriting wins. I think those are very well deserved. Yeah. And Agreed. I think Jojo Rabbit was the most recent one that I saw. It was the last one I saw the night before with the Oscars. Um, and I feel like it's another example of, I've, you know, I've talked before about how I'm always looking for movies that you can kind of easily see the structure of it. And it's also like, it's a good example it's built organically into the story, but it's also following that kind of perfect structure in case you're trying to learn it and be able to spot it. And Jojo Rabbit really follows like conventional structure beats like to a T mm-hmm. um, and really earns all of the beats. Like, you know, there's really powerful sacrifices that the protagonist has to make in order to change and all, all these things that it, it, I think it's a really good film to study if you're trying to kind of get the basic story structure into your bones. So, and, and it's very fun and very enjoyable, very lovely. Um, so yeah, Jojo rabbit thumbs up. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you everyone for listening. This has been our conversation about Casino Royale and we will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye everybody. Bye.